Today, I'm going to try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Flying-type Pokemon. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I often find the Pokemon community instinctively says, Oh, Flying-types, you mean the early root bird Pokemon? Or perhaps the pseudo-legendary dragons? Or the crazy legendaries? But honestly, the Flying-type has so many more hidden gems to offer, such as the plentiful possible encounters that this run offers. Well, okay, some gems, but also a lot of Pokemon thought to be kind of mid. And that's precisely why I thought this would be a fun challenge to pursue, both for difficulty and to discover some great underrated flying types. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Black 2 with only the first flying type that we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and the battle mode on set at all times. And if you want to fly to the heights of gaming, check out today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, a free-to-play collection RPG for mobile and PC. As Pokemon fans, I know you guys love stats and collecting characters, so let me break this down for you. Over 700 unique champions to collect, 15 awesome factions with tons of interesting characters, 12 imposing dungeons to conquer, classic, tag team, and real-time live arena PvP combat, regular content updates, endless customization, and over 400 million fellow players in over 190 countries. The sheer amount of content and frequent new content is a huge part of why I myself love the game. And challenge lovers, you're in luck. They've just added a fearsome new boss, Akumori the Phantom Shogun. This undead general is guarding everything you need for Accessory Ascension, a new feature that allows you to upgrade your gear to even greater heights. And don't miss out on the incredible animated limited series, Raid Call of the Arbiter. You can check out all 10 episodes on Raid's official YouTube channel now. If you haven't joined 400 million players and begun your Raid journey yet, what are you waiting for? New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. Alright, it's time to take on quite possibly the greatest Pokemon game ever made. It's definitely up there. Oh no, Professor Juniper. You could have picked any Pokemon, but that thing? I still have nightmares to this day about Tail Slap, Choice Band, Skill Link, Chinchino, and now there's an even worse version of it out there. Thanks, Gen 9. Ah, the fall time, my favorite season. Beautiful colors, moderate temperatures, and everything is dying. Hello, Karate Man. It's too bad. If you had a Pokemon with you as well, you could compete with Hugh and see who's the better trainer. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Meeting Bianca at the top of the hill, we can grab our starter Pokemon, and unfortunately none of them get the flying type, so I'm just gonna pick Tepig, which I nickname Ollie. This will give Hugh Oshawott, which will likely be the biggest challenge for us, as the other two are weak to flying. Who would have guessed? We've gotta take on Hugh next, and the battle goes smoothly enough with us being left at half health. In the Pokemon Center, Bianca then gives us some Pokeballs, meaning the run has officially begun. Meet lots of Pokemon and catch them, okay? Will do, whack job. Now leave me alone! Uh, oh, nah, what the hell? Our very first viable encounter comes right nearby on Route 20 where we can find a P-Dove which I catch and nickname Captain Pete. Pete ends up having a naive plus speed and minus special defense nature which is pretty good and also the super lock ability to raise its critical hit rate. Incredible. We just might redeem on Pheasant after all. With Pete in hand, we're now forced to box Ali. Goodbye, my friend. I'll never forget the time we traversed Route 19 together. Good times. Now, I'm quite happy right about now, as not only does Pete's nature allow us to escape Pokemon since we're faster, which was very helpful at a mere level 2, but also, with Wild Patchrat nearby, we can get attack EVs, which we are going to need, and we don't have to waste any XP getting speed EVs. This way, solely taking down level 2 Patchrats, they give 15 XP, meaning we can get around 25 attack EVs or so. And this is another thing I love about seasons in Pokemon. Hidden areas you can only access depending on leaves or snow, etc. At the ranch, we have to battle Hugh again, this time with an actual flying type, and Pete having a stab flying move in Gust is helpful, but it being a special attack means it doesn't do all that much damage, but Oshawott could only bring us to about half anyway. For playing hide and seek with a deranged Team Plasma member, we get gifted the Frustration TM, which might be helpful as a stab move that grows in power the more your Pokemon hates you. And what can I say? Pete has a lot of rage in his heart. After the former champion who got humiliated by N gives us some Oran berries, it's time to hit up the first gym, the Aspersia City one, to go pick on some kids. With Pete now having learned Frustration and Quick Attack, it seems that Frustration is doing a bit more damage, which is good, although I definitely could have walked less to have Pete be less friendly, but he still is able to run through the various Patrats and Lillipops quite smoothly, especially when they tend to use stat-lowering moves instead of attacking. Looks like these kids should definitely stay in school. The first gym leader is Charon, the former rival in the black and white games, and 
and a normal type specialist. Now, unless you have like a fighting type run ongoing, his battle can be kind of a toss up. It depends how much he decides to power up his attack with work up. Against his Patrat, we outspeed with frustration, but unfortunately it does just under half before he powers up. I then switch to quick attack in case we get the range, but nope, he ends up right in the red and hits us for a third or so. Hitting him again after his potion then allows us an out-prioritizing quick attack to take him down, and we get the level up, which is allowed in hardcore Nuzlocks by the way, you just have to be at or below the cap when the battle starts. In comes his ace next, a lily pup, quite a big threat with a 60 base attack and 55 speed this early. We do outspeed thanks to our nature, and frustration does a third before he charges up his attack. Dangerous, but we have no choice as we hit him low, then he lands a stab tackle, and we survive on just 8 HP before our berry, and then can out-prioritize him with quick attack for the victory and our first badge. Whew. See what I mean? You never really have a solid plan against him, but we pulled through. And we get the workup TM for winning. But an even better TM awaits us back at the entrance as Bianca becomes useful for once and gives us return. Which, when Pete actually likes us a lot, and a big assumption that'll ever happen, becomes a 102 power stab move with a high crit chance thanks to super luck. Damn. <laughs> uh, is your friend on steroids? Nah, he insists that he's all natty. Primals! I'm making this video to apologize. Bianca's not done coming in clutch yet as she also hands us the sea gear, which will actually be key for a new encounter or two later on. A brief trip lands us in Verbank City where the second gym is, and only elite super mega gamers know that there's a hidden silk scarf in this ridiculous path. Okay, everyone knows that by now, but the point is it's going to be great for our normal type P-Dove. After grabbing the Thief TM nearby for type boosting items, using the Sea Gear we can now access something really cool. In Gen 5, Game Freak introduced an app for the 3DS called the Pokemon Dream Radar, which allowed you to essentially catch Pokemon and import them directly to your game. The vast majority of these Dream Radar Pokemon are only available very late in game. However, for new players, they introduced five Pokemon that you could import from the start of the game, one of which is Swablu. I name ours Amelia, and she has a docile neutral nature, which is ideal for a future Altaria, actually. I then spend a while running around like an absolute madman to increase both our Pokemon's friendship for stab return. With that out of the way, let's hit up the Verbank City Gym. Now, I may be a rock and roll fan, but I'm not a fan of this damn gym. It has caused us some great pain in the past. Fortunately, with a 100 2 power move this early on and the Silk Scarf for further power, we're able to do massive damage on even their bulky poison types like Grimer and Coughing, only being tripped up by their non-attacking moves like Disable, but all in all a pretty clean run through. The second gym leader though, Roxy, can be quite tricky, but I think we've got a good shot here. She leads with a Coughing and I get Pete out there. Return does two thirds off the bat and then she just goes for Assurance. I was greatly fearing the chance to poison, but we can now take her down and then in comes her ace, Whirlipede. With Venashock, which doubles in power if the target is poisoned. After she protected the first turn, Return did just around half. Then Venashock slammed us below half immediately. And here, this is tricky. Switching into Amelia is a no-go even with the Pecha Berry, but also one more hit and we are done for. Air Cutter does have a high crit chance plus super luck, but Return getting the range is a higher chance for us, so I literally have no choice. I have to hope Return gets the range here as it's a very close call on exactly half, and we get it. That was a very scary moment as I'm liking our setup and didn't want to have to restart the game. Two badges. You're going to Pokestar Studios? What? No, I, I'm not. I. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Traversing back to chase a Plasma Grunt, we have to battle these two girls now that we have two Pokemon, and oh, you poor, poor souls. Fate is cruel, my friends. A quick boat trip across the harbor lands us in the biggest city in the franchise until this point, Castelia. A true accomplishment on the DS. Castelia is like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory for useful items as we can grab the Quick Claw right away. <laughs> can I make the first move on you? Then, we can lie to this girl saying that we picked Oshawott initially. Shh, no one has to know. They're gonna know. 
how would they know? As hopefully we will have a couple cool water types later. While training up, we have our first evolution as our starter Pete evolves into a Tranquil. I can't imagine the power that this thing's gonna have now. Rummaging through the buildings, I also find Fennel, who we're going to need the help of later in the run. While gathering Pokedex entries up north on Route 4 for a particular reason, we can grab yet another mystic water before going down into the mystical water of the Castelia sewers. And for once, I did something smart, realizing that with Hugh by our side, he could very well kill our next encounter, so I repelled until we were alone again, at which point we can now safely find a Zubat which I catch and nicknamed Penny, and who has... Yup, an adamant nature, plus attack and minus special attack. Finally, the nature gods shine upon us as that is wicked. Now, while mapping out the encounters for the run, I almost forgot there's a secret entrance to what is arguably a later part of this game, the Relic Passage, which is surprisingly the only place until like several badges later that we can find a Woobat, which I catch and nickname Natasha. Natasha has a jolly plus speed and minus special attack nature, half good, half terrible, and the Klutz ability meaning held items do nothing for us. Yep, one of the few actively bad abilities for Pokemon. Oh, damn it. Well, we can drown our woes by eating some leftovers on the sewer floor. Okay, we won't actually eat them. We'll just force our Pokemon to. Filling up our Pokedex even further in the Castelia Park, well, call me Elliot Kipchoge as I then run around like a madman again because guess what, we have two friendship evolutions to do now. But we do have some help as there is a massage girl in the city who I get to hasten up Natasha's love for us. No, not that Natasha. With as much love as a demented bat can give, Penny eventually evolves into a Golbat, quite an all-around good Pokemon actually, and Natasha also evolves into a Swoobat. Well, without Klutz, they're usually pretty good, but we'll see what happens. That final evolution actually helps us meet the exact requirements for the 40 Pokemon scene to get one of the best items in the game, the Eviolite, to boost the defenses of unevolved Pokemon. With that in hand, let's take on the Castelia City Gym. In here, I decide to give Penny the Eviolite, and man oh man, she absolutely destroyed the gym trainers, although the odd part rock-type Dwebble in here did cause some trouble. The third gym leader is Berg, the bug-type specialist, and yeah, we have a big type advantage, but as with all hardcore Nuzlocks, I'm not counting my birds before they hatch. He leads with a Swat Loon, and I get Penny out there to decimate it in one four times super effective stab wing attack. A good start. In comes a bit of a threat though, Dwebble. Wing attack hits for a third before it then uses rock polish to raise its speed. I then went for Astonish as I didn't want to bring him into potion range and was hoping for the flinch but he actually outsped and hit us with smackdown. Huh. Another hits us to 42 HP as wing attack still doesn't KO in the red. Uh oh. Now he heals up fully and Penny has to duke it out with him as suddenly we're hit again and survive on just 14 HP. A crit was a range to KO admittedly and we can land one last attack to take that damn thing down. But from here, I know we should have enough speed to get the job done as we do indeed outspeed Levani and take it down with a four times damage attack. Wow, surprisingly scary for a bug team against a flying one, huh? After the battle, we get an epic reward though as Penny evolves again into a monster crowbat. Can't wait to see what this thing can do with an adamant nature. Back on Route 4, we have a challenge I've been dreading this entire time. Colrus, a steel type trainer. Not only does steel resist flying, but he starts with a part electric type magnemite. Sheesh. Doing any damage at all is a struggle here as every single one of our moves on all our Pokemon are resisted. But I lead with our newly evolved Penny. I go for Confuse Ray right away and then he makes it through to paralyze us immediately. Not good. Since he four times resists flying, I try to start going for bite, but spark hits us hard, although leftovers do help. And we stay paralyzed. Things continue in this manner for a few more turns and I eventually confuse him again with us below half. He then hits us to 22 HP as we finally get an attack off to bring him low and I realize I have to switch. So I bring in Natasha as he hits himself. From there, Heart Stamp brings him to just a sliver and he hits himself again for the self KO. Nice. In comes Clink next and Natasha is quickly outdone so I get Amelia out there with the Eviolite who tanks gear grind reasonably well. Then we get off the sing on the next turn. We just have to hope that he stays asleep long enough as we need all the power we can get with Pete back out there for the stab 102 power Silk Scarf boosted return and we get two hits off in a row and even through resistance he gets the job done. Damn that was terrifying but we pulled through. 
Now, Route 4 is an interesting one as the designs are entirely different between the two versions, and there is something that we can get here, but only on Thursdays, so we'll have to come back later. We can grab some citrus berries though, even though this old man said, well, there is nothing here. Liar! Oh, hey, look, I never knew Pokemon had a racing simulator. How cool is this? I'm an avid Mario Kart fan, so this is just brilliant. In the desert up ahead, we had a terrifying moment as Natasha survived a fire-punching Darumaka on just 1 HP after both burn damage and sand. And fortunately, Penny saved our entire run. That was the thinnest of margins. But hopefully, it'll all be worth it as further up ahead in the desert resort, we can find our next encounter, a Siglyph that I catch and nickname Hangman. Hangman has a jolly nature, plus speed and minus special attack. Half good, half bad, but at least it does have the magic guard ability. Our next destination is upon us the bright and bustling Nimbasa city. Before anything, I head to the northeastern gate to get the Macho Brace, as for what we have next, we're gonna need it to double the EVs that we get big time. Trying to dodge trainers went really well as I swerved between them like an absolute legend. Oh, f Route 16 to the east brings a hellish yet crucial encounter for us, a 10% chance, but only in shaking grass spots, which take forever to spawn. Eventually we find it though, an Emolga, which not only snapped out of confusion right away, but crit Penny to a quarter. Goodness gracious. We ended up safely catching it though, and named it Carol, who has a sassy plus special defense and minus speed nature. Not great, but it was holding a cherry berry, which could come in handy. I had a really strange feeling about this man in the forest, almost Almost as if he wasn't really human. Ooh, it's Twilight. <laughs> Okay, I was really hoping our next encounter might be kind of cool, as in the Lost Lorn Forest we can find a combi, but of course we got a male, meaning it cannot evolve at all. Huh. I name him Jester, and that's all I have to say about that. One day we'll get a Vespaquin. Going ahead to Route 5, Bianca is killing it yet again, giving us one of the best moves in the game for two reasons. The Fly HM, perfect for our team. Wait, what's back here, Bianca? What is it? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, they just won't leave me alone. Picking up the game the next day, we can do something extraordinarily cool. Head back to Route 4, where only on Thursdays there's an overworld encounter, a fully evolved Mandibuzz exclusive to Black 2 and which you normally have to level up to 54 in order to get. I name her Charlotte and checking her in the PC, she has a rash plus special attack and minus special defense nature, which is interesting. She also has nasty plot already along with the weak armor ability. I'm gonna replace Swablu with her for now as she doesn't yet have the dragon type so she offers no real type advantage. And next comes what I've been fearing most, the Nimbus. City Gym. And even after EV training her, and with base stats like this, Charlotte is barely bulky enough to pull through the trainers. Fortunately, our Snarl move does have a 100% chance to lower the opponent's special attack, but Electro Ball is especially dangerous since it takes advantage of how slow we are. Carol, on the other hand, is neutral against Electric, but is definitely quite frail. Well, here goes nothing. The fourth gym leader, Elisa, the electric expert whose level cap is just two levels lower than when Pete would fully evolve. Oh boy. I spent forever just theory crafting how we might make this possible, and I have a smidgen of a plan. She leads with an Emolga of all things, and I get Hangman out there. Incredibly, Hangman learned Light Screen by level up, so I get that up before Pursuit then hits us. I use Psybeam for over half, and then she goes for Pursuit again, but gets a crit. Are you kidding me? Our Berry does help though, but knowing Pursuit is on both it and her ace, I switch now into Charlotte, with Hangman surviving on just 11 HP in the red. That crit really Really messed up my plan timing, but she then volt switches, and Charlotte eats it pretty well with the light screen up, and Snarl only does a third on Flaffy, lowering her special attack in the process, and we get leftovers of recovery. Another brings her to the red, then she paralyzes us. Our light screen then goes down, and she heals fully, and we stay paralyzed. Why? Volt switch then hits before Amolga comes back out, and now we get off a Snarl, which takes it down. Okay, that's something. In comes Flaffy again which immediately Volt switches into Zeb Stryka, a frightening prospect, and we stay paralyzed. Oof. I have to switch, but into what? I decide to go with Carol, and she went for Pursuit, which hits Charlotte instead. Good, actually. She then uses Quick Attack, as her acrobatics does even less than I thought. But then, Imolga's static paralyzes her. 
Oh man, one of the few ways you can paralyze an electric type as Carol gets her right around to half before I have to switch. With no choice left, I go into Pete hoping she stays paralyzed, but she doesn't and lands a volt switch and Pete tanks it on just 12 HP. But this means her full health Flaffy then comes in and I have nothing I can switch in. I just have to hope that Super Luck pulls through, but nope, she tanks a return on a quarter and takes down Pete with one more attack. Ouch. From here though, I can get Penny out there, take her down with Bite, and then go for Fly on the Zeb Strika, and we get a crit to take her down. I mean, between Paralysis and Penny's good bulk, we likely didn't need it, but better than risking yet another crit. Man, losing Pete was so rough. I wanted to prove on Pheasant's pretty underrated, and I mean, Pete's supposed to be the main character after all, but that could have gone much worse, I suppose. Well, as some recompense, we do get to hit up the Driftvale Drawbridge now, where we can hit up the Shadows to find a Ducklet, our next encounter, which I catch and name Halo, who has a gentle plus special defense and minus defense nature. Should give us some nice water coverage. We then arrive in Driftvale City where there's some drama going down. My dear precious Pokemon, kick back and relax today. Please kill me. Disposable items seem to disappear. Yeah, tell that to my 13 year old self. I'll never forget losing a focus sash in game. Idiot. Unfortunately, the move tutor here has nothing really good for us at the moment, and to add insult to injury, thanks old man. An air balloon for a flying team. Just great. Some Pokemon evolve by trade. Cool, right? Why do they evolve? Hmm, how do I put this? Hello. I like money. Well, at least one good thing comes out of this dump. The expert belt item from our main man, Timothy. Yep, that's his name from now on. The Driftvale Gym is next, and with our new catch Halo, we can actually do reasonably well against the ground types with Bubble Beam and the Eviolite to help us out. The fifth gym leader though, Clay, the ground type expert, oh man, his Excadrill resists or is immune to every single thing we have but Halo, but Halo doesn't evolve until level 35 just after the cap. Hey, wait a minute, that's my line. He leads with an Intimidate Croc Rock, so I get Halo out there. With some EVs under our belt, even I was surprised that we not only outsped, but one hit KO'd that thing with a stab super effective bubble beam. Damn. Then, in it comes, his Excadrill. I had two choices here, but I went for the Feather Dance, and Rock Slide ravaged us to just 15 HP in the red before we lowered his attack. Now, I can safely switch in Penny for the Slash, and then confuse him. He did get off the Rock Slide though, but with lowered attack, it's not too much of a worry. I now go for Fly, hoping he hits himself, and he does, and then we do about a quarter. Rock Slide hits again to just 23 HP, but our berry helps. I need to not get crit here, as I know he could hit himself or miss it too, and he hits himself again as Fly brings him to a quarter before his berry brings him to half. But he snaps out and lands another, but Penny tanks it on 15 HP. With no choice, I go into Hangman, and he went for Slash instead. This allows me to get the Reflect up, and with minus two attack and Reflect, he can't do much at all now. As I go for Air Cutter, hoping for the crit, but we don't get it. Now, something strange happened here. The AI went for Bulldoze of all things, then Rock Slide, but then healed up fully. Uh-oh. We were just not getting crits at all here, but I could reset Reflect and keep chipping him down until we were both left in the one hit range, but we do outspeed so one final Psybeam takes him down. Go Hangman, go. In comes his final Pokemon, a Sand Slash, and I know Charlotte can help us here, but not only does Crush Claw have a chance to lower our defense, but every time we get hit, Weak Armor does too. Although it does increase our speed, and the two of them slug it out repeatedly, Crush Claw versus Snarl, and Charlotte emerges the victor to win us our fifth badge. Challenging, but our team held up well there. At the Pokemon World Tournament, we can now access the move relearner to get things like a half decent psychic move on Natasha, Confusion, and shortly thereafter, Halo evolves into a beautiful. Swana, which I can't wait to see what capabilities it has. As it turns out, a lot of them as Halo carries us through the regional tournament, not only taking down Hughes Pokemon single-handedly, but even taking down Chorus through his now fully evolved Magneton with the Rain Dance and Bubble Beam combo. Damn. Grabbing the two Rocky Helmet items from the World Tournament and the Relic Passage... Uh... Excuse me? Are you a flying type? You, you have wings. We can now grab a pivotal move, Surf from Hugh, which I immediately teach to Halo for a huge power-up. Uh, my dude, you do realize we're a flying team, right? No, sir! 
blitzing through the charged stone cave, we can pick up some great items like the magnet to help boost Carol's electric power, along with the metal coat for a future encounter. Arriving in Mistralton City, the domain of flying type Pokemon and flying machines, we can pick up a sky drop TM, which could have been a better flying TM, but oh well, as we can also get the sharp beak from a girl in the airport. Wasting no time, we can then hit up the Mistralton gym right away, and as I'm sure you could guess, Carol with the magnet fries all the flying type trainers in here with ease. The six gym leaders Skyla are flying type arch nemesis, and although same types are usually tricky, Carol is the perfect answer. As not even a tract works on her, tanking a mere heart stamp and one hit KOing Swoobat with Shockwave. And the same goes for her Swana, who did outspeed us with Bubble Beam down to a third, but got eviscerated afterward. A shame that we have a minus speed nature, but oh well. In comes Skarmory next, and we have a really cool answer here, Volt Switch, which brings her down to sturdy and lets us safely pivot into Halo. She merely used agility before she healed on the next turn, so two surfs did her in from there to win us the battle and our sixth badge. We get the acrobatics TM for winning too, not too shabby. <laughs> oh my dude, normally I am intimidated by you, but this run, you better watch out. I'll remember you blocking our path. Okay, you know, there are a lot of contexts in which you offering us your lucky egg in the middle of a cemetery would be mightily inappropriate. Grabbing the charge beam TM from a random person in a house and the spell tag in the Pokemon Center. Oh, you have a spell tag? Where in the world did you find it? Wh what? You just gave it- Oh, oh no. The outside of Reversal Mountain is a weird place, but long story short, one of our possible encounters is only found here, but an encounter that we can get somewhere else is here too with a higher chance, so it's best to skip it for now with repels. Grabbing the toxic orb from inside the mountain, we can then get a little redemption against an all too familiar enemy. Ah, that's cathartic. Making it out of the mountain, we hit up Route 14 where we can get our next encounter, a Driftblim, which I catch and nickname Reuben. With that having been caught, we can now head back to the grass from earlier and find a Skarmory that I named Bradshaw. Checking the PC, it turns out Reuben has a naive plus speed and minus special defense nature, along with Unburden, amazing, and Skarmory has a sassy plus special defense and minus speed nature. I'm gonna replace Natasha for Reuben now, as they serve a similar function, but Klutz is just not worth carrying around. Picking up the Shadow Ball TM behind it, we then hit up this eerie haunted house, which is scarier than my babysitter was. Oh hey, a lunar wing! Whoa, jeez, what the f- Back in Undella Town, we have another rival battle with Hugh, although this time I'm not as nervous. Against his unpheasant, we could use Shockwave from Carol, which barely didn't KO, but he just used Razor Wind, so another did the trick. Then his Samrod came out, which did outprioritize us with Aqua Jet, but Electro Ball did two thirds, and then he didn't go for it again on the next turn, so we KO'd it. And finally, his Simi Sage was devastated by an Acrobatics for the win. Go, Carol, go. You just don't know when to quit, do you? Ah, Lacunosa Town, a beautifully designed town that is quite literally good for one thing. The metronome item found in one of the houses. There is nothing else here, man. It's such a waste. Back at the PC, I'm gonna replace Sigilyph for Skarmory for now, as I think it better suits our upcoming challenges. Heading way back to Route 13, I realized we forgot to pick up the Psychic TM with Surf after we just boxed both of our Psychic Pokemon. Genius. Surfing underneath the village bridge to avoid Gentleman Stonewall, we can get five Citrus Berries here, which are hard to come by in the these games and then oh come on no you do not want to try this i am your four times super effective nightmare no one asked what happened to verzion okay let's just move on to opelucid a place of not violence peace in fact straight to the gym we go and our new party member bradshaw performs excellently in here resisting all the trainer's stab moves but i do keep forgetting this one trainer's dreadagon has flamethrower of all things which nearly took him out although halo was a great switch in there to save the day the seventh gym leader is brayden the dragon type expert and if you look at his team and their move pools bradshaw is a perfect answer being a physically defensive beast we took down dreadagon with hardly any damage done to us in the end, and Flygon did use Dragon Tail to bring up Penny after Fly hit him to half, but he hurt himself on a rocky helmet in the process, and he brought out a Pokemon that he can't possibly hope to outspeed, as Penny finishes him off. His final Pokemon was then Haxorus, which I used Confuse Ray on right away. He then started Dragon Dancing, which is definitely a bit worrying, but at the same time, the more he raises his attack, the more he damages himself if he does hit himself in Confusion. And after we got Bradshaw back out there, that's exactly what he does after three three dragon dances, tanking Steelwing well after his berry, but then hitting himself hard to a quarter and getting
getting taken out by one more. Bradshaw is a perfect counter there. I can't get over that. Okay, is it just me or does the whole flying pirate ship thing remind anyone else of the Edge Chronicles novel series? Anyone? Our next big challenge is Zinzolin, a Plasma Sage, and although an Ice-type trainer with two Cryogonals and a Weavile seems like a daunting prospect for us, I got Bradshaw out there and knowing he'd confuse us, attached a person berry to heal us, and then used a Totemize to raise our speed. That way we could then one-hit KO all three of them with a stab super effective Steel Wing. I was pretty proud of that strat, not gonna lie. The Shadow Triad also seemed like a tough challenge on the face of it, but Halo's raw power with Surf and the Mystic Water saved us, otherwise Steel types wall us hard. We know that all too well. I moved here to be the first in the Marine Tube. Oh, go, 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 go! Haha. -ha. Oh wait, there's other people here already. Oh, hey look, a Whale Lord. That's rare. That sprint has us arrive in Humalau City, the location of the eighth and final gym. Straight up, it's a beautiful gym and all, but Carol went nuts and destroyed the whole thing after she learned 80 power discharge. A flow soul did outspeed and hit us hard with Aqua Tail. A crit would have KO'd in fact, but aside from that, nearly everything was a one hit KO for us. The eighth gym leader is Marlin, the water type expert. Although he'd seem like an easy one to pick off, he does lead with a part rock type Caracosta with sturdy of all things, which is kind of a nightmare for our team. I theorycrafted forever trying to find a way to account for it, and here's my best plan. I lead with Emolga and immediately go for the Volt Switch to hurt it bad and get out of there. Here I get Halo in, and Smackdown hits us hard to just 41 HP. But now, I know he's gonna potion, meaning he won't use Shell Smash, which would have destroyed us, as we can attack twice in a row with Surf to take him down. In comes a gigantic Wailord next, and here a switch into Bradshaw can take advantage of it repeatedly using Bounce by using Fly afterwards, meaning every time he goes to hit us, we're in the air, and then can come back down on him. Too far. Funny. But to prepare, while he's in the red, I switched into Carol for the Discharge KO, and then in comes Jellicent, his final Pokemon. Discharge does big damage, and gets the paralysis, but he made it through anyway, and Scald nailed us to just 30 HP, and got the burn, but we survive on just 15 HP in the red. Sheesh. Realizing Discharge might not quite have the range, I play it safe and go for Volt Switch to the red, then bring in another great counter, Charlotte, for the stab super effective Snarl KO for our final badge. Well, we managed. With that win, we can now grab a few new encounters. First, on Route 22, we can catch a Deli Bird that I named Lee. Then, by surfing on Route 21, only in the rustling water spots at just a 5% chance we can find a Mantine that I caught and named Kazansky. Finally, heading back to Route 11, we can pick up an encounter that I forgot wasn't just on Route 23 later, a Gligar, which I catch and nickname Metcalf. Metcalf has a lax plus defense and minus special defense nature, not great for our purpose, but I replace Halo the Swana with her for now, and add Swablu to the team in place of Skarmory. Training the latter up for our next challenge, Amelia eventually evolves into an Altaria. Should be a crucial part of our team's infrastructure. After the pirate ship, uh explodes or something? We can grab the Ice Beam TM from the giant Chasm Cave, then Hugh gets frustrated with the former team Plasma members and basically pulls a Thanos. Fine. I'll do it myself. In the exterior of the cave, we can grab yet another encounter, this time a Pelipper that I caught and named Chipper. But I don't think he'll have much over Halo. Well, here we go. A battle I've been fretting big time. Colrus with a ridiculous team with steel types everywhere in addition to sturdy and even an Eviolite Magneton. Looking at our team, it's straight up our worst nightmare, but I think I have a plan. He leads with that Magneton, and I get Amelia out there, who's not weak to electric with the new dragon typing. Sing misses immediately, then he volt switches. Oh god, I was not expecting this, as in comes Magnezone. Oh no. But we outspeed and hit this one at least. Okay, so my plan is a bit shot, but I go for the backup with Bradshaw sent out, knowing even if he did wake up, we have Sturdy and can't be one hit KO'd. Then, I get Spikes up, knowing they're critical to deal with Sturdy. I then get some damage off to break his Sturdy as he wakes up and paralyzes us. Knowing an electric move is coming, I now switch in Metcalf with the Eviolite, then can outspeed and take him down with Dig now that his Sturdy is broken. Nice. Kling Clang then has an air balloon, so I acrobatic it to break it and then he used shift gear, but he just went for it again so a dig took him down from there. Metang suffered the same fate after two of them, only getting off a meteor mash in the process. Behem gets hit hard by spikes and super effective X scissor and weirdly went for recover, so after a psychic hit us to half we could take him down with another. And finally the biggest threat of all, Eviolite Magneton has sturdy broken by the spikes, then a 4 times super effective stab 80 power dig finishes him. Wow. 
Even though our plan was shaken, the resilience sure paid off. With that battle out of the way, we can find a hugely necessary encounter using the Dream World. Not the Dream Radar, as in the windswept sky there is a default encounter available, a Yanma, which I catch and nickname Perry, with a calm plus special defense and minus attack nature. Not bad. It also has Giga Drain by default, but doesn't have speed boost unfortunately. Regardless, I'm going to replace Emolga for now. At level 33, Perry learns Ancient Power, which is the trigger for him evolving into a monster Yan Mega. I still wish this thing had gotten a Mega Evolution, by the way. Some legendary madness then ensues, and you have to face Kyurem with the same Pokemon that you lead with in the next battle. So, it got kind of scary as we did get crit, but our berry saved us, and a final Dragon Pulse finished off that monstrosity. And now, the final Team Plasma challenge begins. Getsis, with a diverse and incredibly powerful team. Against his Kofagrigus, I led with Amelia and go for Sing, but we miss, and he gets off the Toxic. We hit our next one, though, and now I switch in Ruben relatively safely. I now go for Stock to raise our defenses, and he wakes up and lands a Toxic on us too. Oh, come on. I get another one off though as he protects, then nail him with Shadow Ball to the red before his then hits us and gets the special defense drop. Why is this happening? Knowing he'll heal, I hit him again. Then I'm forced to baton pass the boost early to Perry, who gets hit by Shadow Ball. And yup, special defense drop, meaning we're now at a neutral special defense despite two stockpiles. Unbelievable. Then we miss Air Slash. This cannot be real life, as Shadow Ball then hits, and a third special defense drop. I hate everything. We then finally get the KO, then in comes Hydreigon, and fortunately we can stab super effective Bug Buzz him into oblivion. But then, Electros. There is nothing I can safely switch in here, and without the three drops that we got, we'd be safe, but now all I can do is hit him to the red before Perry goes down. Charlotte can then take him out with Dark Pulse at least, but then in comes Seismitoad, who Perry was supposed to take care of with Giga Drain. But now, we just need to hope for no accuracy drops from Muddy Water as I nasty plotted to give us the range, and two Dark Pulses get the job done. In comes Drapion next, and he can't really do much on us, so I get him the Rocky Helmet recoil before Air Slash brings him low. Then, because of weak armor activating, I know we'll now outspeed, so another one KOs. His final Pokemon is Toxicroak, and to play it safe, I switch into Metcap who gets taken down to 68 HP before an acrobatics does the trick after Dig brought him to the red. Man, what an unfortunate loss of Perry, incredibly unlucky with three special defense drops, but his sacrifice pulled us through. Meeting Anne at the gates of Victory Road, he gives us the Waterfall HM, which is gonna unlock a massively important evolutionary item for us. But before that, ah, the beautiful entrance to Victory Road. Back on Route 11, there's a hidden area only accessible by Waterfall, and here lies the Razor Fang. Sweet. Using it, we can level up Metcalf at night to evolve her into a beastly Gliscor, one of my faves of Gen 4. Moving forward, I'm going to replace Altaria with Emolga for now, and after a long trek, we reach the end of Victory Road, where he awaits us for a final battle. Against his Unfezen, I lead with Carol, and Discharge makes KFC out of that bird before Samrot comes out, who survives one on just a sliver, but also gets paralyzed but makes it through and then lands a super effective ice beam and we survive on just 7 HP. But we get frozen. What was that sequence? Well, I know he'll heal but to be safe I get Halo out there and we miss Air Slash but he stays paralyzed. What is actually happening? Ultimately the paraflinch strategy works, taking him down, only getting hit by one ice beam. Bufalant is a tough one but Metcalf walls him hard. Especially since we predicted the wild charge on Halo upon switch in, and we could sword dance, and with Rocky Helmet plus Head Smash Recoil, we could take him down with a final dig. I then played it safe with Simi Sage's speed, having Bradshaw obliterate him with Fly for the victory. For winning, we get the amazing Thunderbolt TM, and that would have been real helpful giving us the range on his damn Samurott. Leaving our rival behind us, we arrive at our final destination, the Unova Region Pokemon League. After fulfilling the rest of our EVs and getting any remaining items and TMs that we need, it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost-type trainer, and I think we have a perfect answer for her. She leads with a 
Sarcophagrigus and I get Ruben out there with the expert belt attached. With our speed and special attack investment, we can not only instantly take it down with Stab's super effective Shadow Ball, but also her fellow Driftblim too. Then, in comes her Chandelure, and we outspeed even it as well, but it somehow survives on like 1 HP even though my calcs told me that we had this in the bag, and pulverizes Ruben with an even more powerful Shadow Ball apparently. No way! I had Ruben in my plans for other Elite Four members too, so that is not good. From there though, at least we do have Halo who can outspeed with the Stab super effective Surf KO, then thankfully do the same to her Golurk who has the ground type and so shares that water weakness. I was not expecting a death there, in fact I was anticipating just a clean sweep, but onwards we go I guess. The second Elite Four member is Grimsley, the Dark type specialist, and with Fake Out Lipard, Intimidate Crocodile, and a dreaded Steel type Bisharp, this one's tricky. I lead with Charlotte against his Lipard knowing that he can't attract us, and after Fake Out, which I knew would activate our weak armor, we then outspeed with Air Slash, which does flinch, but doesn't do over half. Damn. I now nasty plot though, not wanting to activate his heal, and Aerial Ace gets a crit on us. But then we can KO with another. With the defense drop, Scrafty is now too much of a threat, so I switch in Bradshaw, who tanks it well after leftovers, and Fly does good damage before Rock Tomb lowers our speed. I know we need Halo out there for what's coming though, so I hope for the flinch after he heals, but we don't get it, and he drops our speed with Rock Tomb. Air Slash then knocks him out from there, but in comes Crocodile. After that Rock Tomb, we won't outspeed now, so I have to switch in Metcalf, who tanks Crunch well, even though it was a crit. Amazingly, we then get a crit of our own with Fly to take down that overgrown lizard. His final Pokemon is Bisharp, normally a huge threat, but Metcalf not only walls his attacks pretty hard, but also has Stab super effective Dig, which two hit KOs him with us being brought below half along the way. The third Elite Four member is Caitlyn, the Psychic type expert, and this is often about finding a way to get past her Yon Musharna, and I think I have the perfect thing. I lead with Metcalf, and not only can we use Swords Dance before she yawns us, but I can Swords Dance again knowing she has no way of hurting us with only an electric type offensive move. Then she doesn't use Reflect as I was thinking she would do, so we fall asleep. Then our Chestoberry awakens us, so I can start a plus four sweep with x Scissor, followed by 110 power Acrobatics on Siglyph now that our item has technically disappeared when it woke us up. Then x Scissor again on both her Reuniclus and Gothitelle, both one hit KOs as well for the W. Now that's what I like to see. The last Elite Four member is Marshall, the fighting type expert, and although this one might seem to be a pushover, I've learned to never underestimate this guy with Stone Edge everywhere, sturdy, bulk up, guts, etc. He leads with a throw, and I get Bradshaw out. Fly hits him for two thirds, and then he missed Rock Tomb, amazing, as we don't get the speed drop and take him out on the next turn. Then in comes Mian Xiao, a speedy and powerful threat, but it went for bounce, meaning when we went up in the air, we were involved vulnerable, then could come back down after he did and one hit KO him immediately. Too good. In comes Conkelder next, and knowing bulk up is a huge threat, especially if we're in the air and he gets a free one, I use Taunt to prevent it, and it works as Fly then takes him down below half before his berry. But Hammer Arm did quite a lot on us. Part of my plan here is to have leftovers recover health even when we're up in the air too, but I went for Taunt again after it ran out, thinking he'd try bulking up again, but he didn't and slammed us low with another attack. Whoops. From there, I can get Metcalf out though, who avoids a hammer arm, and then lands an acrobatics to take him out from there with a crit. I'll take it. Then his sock had no chance, only landing a rock slide in the process. Let's go. After using our remaining rare candies, it's time. The final battle, the champion of the Unova region, Iris, technically a dragon type trainer, but she has a wildly diverse team. Big problem being, we hardly have any way to safely deal with her lead, a Hydreigon with Surf and Flamethrower, but I go with Metcalf hoping to avoid the crit. I get a Swords Dance off, then Surf hits us hard to a third, but our berry helps us back up. I have no choice, so I go for the x Scissor, but she barely survives in the red, then nails us with another Surf, but Metcalf lives on one singular HP, and after she heals, can destroy her with two more attacks. No freaking way. In comes another big threat though, Lapras. Knowing that we have the plus two attack and that anything else would get hurt bad by Lapras, I go for acrobatics, and Lapras also just barely survives and takes the legendary Metcalf down. Rest in peace, my dear friend. Here I get Carol out for the immediate Thunderbolt knockdown, and in comes Drudagon. This thing is kind of tricky for our team, so I go for Thunder Wave to paralyze it, but she not only makes it through, but lands a rock slide too, and it instantly takes Carol down. 
Uh, well then, that's some power. This opens an opportunity to safely get Charlotte out though, and I go for the Paraflinch strat with Dark Pulse. It works on the first turn, but on the second she somehow lands another rock slide through both. Our berry heals us though, and then we hit it again, and she lands another. Actually, how? Taking Charlotte down. I can't believe this. But in comes the almighty Halo taking her down with Ice Beam. Then in comes her Archeops, and I was very scared about the speed tier here, but I have faith. And we do outspeed for the super effective Stab Surf KO. Then her Aggron suffers the same fate as well. Holy cow. Then her final Pokemon, her ace, Haxorus. We're in a good position here with Expert Belt Ice Beam, and she does have her Focus Sash after all, and survives on 1 HP, then lands a 147 base attack, stab 80 power dual chop, but Halo somehow tanks it reasonably well and can finish off Iris's career, making us the champion with just two Pokemon remaining. I have no words. Actually, you know what? I do. Swana is officially goaded. Well, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 with only Flying-type Pokemon. And man, did we ever get to explore the potential of some underrated Pokemon and employ some strats I didn't really expect from the typing. MVPs gotta go to Metcalf, Bradshaw, and even Halo the Swana here. They all exceeded my expectations. As always, make sure to subscribe to join the Sylph Army and get us to a quarter million, and I'll see you guys next time for another challenge video.